Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I just remember, remind all members and everyone else who's attending to make sure that their mobile phones are in a, an order that don't interfere with proceedings. The first item on our agenda this morning is to decide whether to consider our draft report on the European Union Withdrawal Bill Supplementary Legislative Consent Memorandum in private in future. Are members agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence on the European Withdrawal Bill from UK Government Ministers, David Mundell, the Secretary of State for Scotland, and Chloe Smith, Minister for the Constitution. I, I welcome both of our witnesses to our proceedings this morning. And members should note that we will need to conclude the session by 11 o'clock to enable our witnesses to give evidence to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, but before we move to questions from the committee, I believe the Secretary of State for Scotland wants to make a short opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I'm pleased to be here with the Minister for the Constitution to support your scrutiny of the EU Withdrawal Bill and the Committee's preparations for its final report. I acknowledge the position set out by the Scottish Government in its supplementary legislative consent memorandum and articulated by Mr Russell in his appearance before this committee yesterday. But there has not yet been a vote in the Scottish Parliament on this issue and there is still time for the Scottish Government to change that view. We have in front of us today proposals which the uh, UK, UK Government and the Welsh Government both agree respect the devolution settlements. They will see significantly more powers for the devolved institutions and will continue to provide legal certainty on how laws will work across the UK when we leave the EU. Last night in the House of Lords, peers from Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat and cross branch groups agreed the Government's amendments on Clause 11 and the deal which has been agreed with the Welsh Government. The House of Lords also did have the opportunity to consider a number of amendments uh, as put forward by the First Minister in her letter to the Lord Speaker. I hope the Committee will see that the UK Government has been constructive and proportionate in its approach to Clause 11. Following the letter I sent to the Committee and the debate in the House of Lords yesterday, I would like to take the opportunity to set out our proposals uh, to address some of the key concerns with the original approach that the Committee raised in its interim report. The Committee suggested that the UK Government needed to find an alternative way forward to Clause 11, and that is what we have done. In doing so, we have sought to build consensus with the Welsh and Scottish Governments, and we have worked with them as we developed our proposals. Our approach is set out in the amendments which we have made to the Bill and the accompanying intergovernmental agreement and memorandum of understanding. It is based on a presumption of devolution. It will also enable the Scottish Parliament to legislate in areas previously covered by EU law as a result of our exit from the EU. We have also agreed with the devolved administrations that frameworks will be required, but, they, but where the, that they will be complicated and they will need time to de be developed. The measures in this bill are needed to deal with them in the short term as we navigate our exit from the European Union. They are temporary and we have made this clear in the sunset arrangements we have included in the bill. We have said that we will work with the devolved administrations as we develop longer term proposals. The amendments we have put forward place a legal obligation on the UK Government to place new regulations before the devolved legislatures. However, we also need to provide certainty to people and businesses on how the UK internal market will be protected if agreement cannot be reached. In that case, it will be for the UK Government to decide whether to ask the UK Parliament to act. But I think it is important to stress that we want to proceed on the basis of agreement. Our approach lends itself to that. In our view, agreement between all governments is still the most likely outcome, with an emphasis on collaborative working. That is why we hope the Scottish Government will reconsider uh, our proposal. I am pleased that the Labour Government in Wales have reached agreement with us. As Mark Drakeford said, this is a deal we can make work which has required compromise on both sides. Our aim throughout these talks has been to protect devolution and make sure laws and policy areas which are currently devolved remain devolved, and this is what has been achieved. I am very pleased to be here today to have the opportunity to discuss 
uh, the agreement in more detail, and along uh, with Chloe, I look forward to taking your questions. Okay, thank you for your opening statement. Obviously, I think all of us recognise around the table there's been significant effort by both governments to try to find agreement. Um, I thank you for your letter, which you sent last night, which I know has now been sent around all the committee members. It lays out clearly what the Scottish gov the, the UK government's position is. But despite all that, we're still at an impasse. Uh, and I guess, the, for me, the, this comes down now to a matter of trust, because, Mr Mandel, the UK government has made a non-legislative commitment not to bring forward legislation that would alter areas of policy insofar as the devolved legislators are prevented from doing so by virtue of Clause 11 regulations. And in evidence to the committee yesterday, Mr Russell stated that if Clause 11 was removed, he would give an identical commitment on behalf of the Scottish Government. He would then be in a position to recommend consent on the EU withdrawal bill to the Scottish Parliament. So the question I have is, why won't the UK Government accept such an amendment from the a position from the Scottish Government as a solution to the current impasse. It would put both governments on an equal basis. Is that you don't trust the Scottish Government? I do trust uh, the Scottish Government and all uh, our workings uh, with uh, the Scottish Government uh, you know, reinforce uh, that in terms of, of how we've been uh, able to work together. And even where um, we haven't reached agreement, uh, we're still able to do that in a perfectly uh, cordial and respectful way. And as you are aware, for example, uh, the JMCEN met yesterday. Uh, and although we're not in agreement still on the issues around uh, Clause uh, 11, uh, we were still uh, able to have you know, a respectful uh, and reasonable conversation. I think we've made absolutely clear from the outset that an amendment which simply deleted Clause 11 wouldn't be uh, an acceptable uh, amendment. We want to ensure that there is clarity and certainty in relation to what happens in respect uh, of uh, the laws that are returning from uh, the, uh, and legal conferences returning from uh, the EU when we leave the EU. And that's what, uh, that's what Clause 11 is about. As you acknowledged in your uh, initial remarks, we've made very uh, significant changes to that clause to take on board the issues that this committee raised, that members of the House of Commons have raised, that members of the House of Lords have raised, that other uh, uh, bodies have raised in terms of uh, ensuring that that clause now has a presumption of devolution, other than in those areas where both governments actually agree uh, that there will be a need for UK-wide frameworks. So I, I believe that what, what we have done, rather than taking you know, a position of deleting the clause, which might be seen, I think, by some as the equivalent to, you know, in, in terms of the for Scottish Government position, in terms to uh, our initial proposal, which might have gone, you know, which, which might have been seen to be too far in favour of uh, the UK government, and what we've sought to do is to find a way through the middle of that uh, and come to uh, you know, a fair and reasonable arrangement. Well, the, the, I'm sure the UK government would argue that in these circumstances, if the UK government's not bound with legis legislation and the Scottish government wasn't bound with legislation, but they both trusted each other, the same end could be met. So why can't that be achieved? I'm, I'm sure... I mean, I'm sure in practical terms it can be achieved. And, you know, one of the things which I find difficult, uh, Convener, about the argument that we're currently uh, undertaking is that we have actually agreed the 24 areas that will require to be the subject of UK, uh, UK frameworks. And so, actually, what we're having at the moment is a debate about how we should formally agree something that we've already agreed. Okay. And, you know, to me, I, I, I mean, being quite frank, you know, I, I, I see that as a head of a pin uh, argument. Instead of actually now focusing on these frameworks, getting these frameworks uh, moving forward in areas that are really important to people uh, across Scotland. Uh, uh I don't want to get into the issue of the 24, because we know, I think the Secretary and, and all of us here know that that, that that 24 can be added to, and I know that Ivan and McKee is going to come to that at the will of the UK government. Uh, but no, that's still, if, if this is ahead of the pin argument, you can sort that problem. 
by putting both governments on the same, in the same position of a non-legislative agreement if there is trust on both sides. Because my, I would believe that in these circumstances, it would make all of the other discussions that will follow on Brexit and common frameworks much more easy to be agreements to be achieved if that basis of trust could be established at the very beginning. And I, certainly from my perspective, I, I, I would ask you to reconsider that as far as the UK government is concer concerned. We've indicated you know, that we continue to have you know, an open door in relation uh, uh, to discussions, uh, and you know, that is the case. But I think we have been, we have been clear that an amendment that simply uh, deleted Clause 11 is, is not one that we could accept. Well, that then puts the governments in a different position. You're, you're, the, the, UK, the Scottish government is bound by legislation. The UK government isn't. That doesn't seem like trust to me. But anyway, let's go on to the issue of if this Parliament, at the end of the day, decides not to give its consent to the EU withdrawal bill uh, process here in the Scottish Parliament, we've been told by your colleagues that you're at the centre of some of these very important negotiations. What will your recommendation be to the UK government if this Parliament does not give its consent? My um, recommendation and explanation uh, to uh, UK government colleagues is that it is the Scottish Parliament that will decide whether or not it gives consent, not the Scottish Government. Of course, the Scottish Government okay. will make a recommendation. Members of this Parliament yeah. uh, will decide. Your uh, report, I'm sure, will be uh, very influential in terms of uh, how people might form a view. But as you know, there are, as I understand it, two weeks uh, to go until that you know, th 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 that debate will be he will be held. I want to put all our efforts into getting uh, agreement with the Scottish Government. I still would like to see agreement with the Scottish Government, and I would like to see this Parliament uh, give a legislative consent uh, to our bill. And if we get to a point uh, where agreement hasn't been uh, reached, then that's the point at which uh, not just speculation, but you know, clearly, uh, events will. Uh, unfold, but I, 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 I think I don't think that it is helpful or useful to you know, speculate about th those events when we're still in a position where agreement could be reached and this Parliament could still give its consent. Yeah, I recognise there's still two weeks to go, but th there's a distinct possibility that this Parliament will refuse consent. What will you recommend to the UK government in these circumstances? I'm, I'm still uh, going to give you the same. Uh, answer convener that I would I want to focus my efforts on ensuring that that we do get consent and I hope you know in my appearance today it may uh, I may uh, I may be thwarted in that aim but that that, that uh, my appearance the minister for contribution appearance you know, that we will be persuasive in terms of putting forward uh, reasons why the bill, as amended uh, last night by the House of Lords, should be, accept should be uh, given legislative consent by uh, this Parliament. Okay, what I'm hearing then from you, Secretary of State, is you're not prepared to say today that, you, that if the Scottish Parliament decided not to give consent, that the UK Government, in these circumstances, would proceed with legislation. Is that the case or is that not the case? I, I think that's a, a, a rather convoluted and hypothetical question, if I may say so, convener. What I'm not, what I'm, what I'm saying is, I'm focusing on the here and now, where we've said that our door is open. Mr. Russell indicated yesterday the Scottish government still want to have conversations. Now, I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be right to suggest that we don't have to differing positions at this moment, because we do, uh, but I, um, you know, I, I still think it's important what happens in this parliament in terms of the debate and discussion uh, that you have here. I don't want uh, to preempt that, and it's not my uh, decision. I do want to encourage the parliament to support a legislative consent motion, but I recognise that that is entirely a matter for uh, this uh, entirely for a matter uh, for this Parliament. So rather than you know, speculating on numerous scenarios, I want to make sure that we're focusing on uh, getting, uh, getting agreement. 
Well, given you have not given a definitive position, I can only conclude then that in these circumstances, the UK government would be prepared to ignore the will of the Scottish Parliament. The UK government is seeking the consent of the Scottish Parliament. That's uh, the legislative. We, we, we would like, and we've we've sought legislative consent, and that's still what we're doing. That's one of the reasons the minister and I are here today, so that we can feed into your committee's report. We want uh, that report to be a positive one that would suggest uh, that Parliament, uh, the Scottish Parliament, should uh, follow uh, the lead uh, of. I, um, the Welsh Government follow the lead of leading devolutionists like Lord Jim uh, Wallace in acknowledging that this is a good uh, and fair uh, arrangement that has been uh, concluded and that it can support legislative consent for this bill. Well, just finally, in, in these circumstances, you still have not confirmed that the UK Government would, 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 would potentially ignore the will of, this, of the Scottish Parliament. So I can only conclude that that is part of the potential decision-making of the UK Government. Adam Tompkins. Well, I, I, obviously, we're not going to uh, concur on that. What I've, well, you're not uh, you know, I've, an, you know, I've you, set out... Do we feel you're not giving me an answer? I've set out clearly what our focus remains on, ge on getting agreement and getting uh, consent. Well... You can, you can understand in these circumstances when I'm left here thinking that the UK government will potentially ignore the will of the Scottish Parliament because you have not given a commitment today to not do that. But, uh, but what we want to do is, you know, is, is, is rather, you know, rather than address that, an issue that may or may not arise, is to address the issue in hand as to why the Parliament should give its consent to this bill. Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Secretary State. Good morning, Minister. Um, thank you for being with us. I want to go back to the issue of trust that the Convener um, opened with. Um, on uh, Monday, giving evidence to the House of Commons Public Administration Committee, Mike Russell said that trust between the United Kingdom Government and the Scottish Government is at its lowest ebb. And the previous day on Sunday, I don't know if you had the misfortune to see the Sunday Herald, but the Sunday Herald led um, with a, a story um, uh, attributing to the First Minister remarks that the United Kingdom government are intent on demolishing devolution. Um, how do you react to these kinds of belligerent comments? I'm disappointed when I hear such uh, comments because they're not reflected by reality. And I think one of the, um, you know, one of the signs of the maturity in the relationships between uh, parliaments uh, is that we are able to disagree and uh, uh, maturity in relationships between governments. We, we, we are able to disagree but still continue a dialogue. So yesterday, when the JMCEN met, we were able to have a very constructive dialogue in relation to how the Scottish Government should be involved in the negotiation process for leaving uh, the EU. We were actually able to have a constructive discussion about how frameworks, the, uh, the frameworks uh, that are the subject of, of a, uh, a, the, the separate um, aspect of this, how they would be agreed. So we are able to have very constructive discussions. Now, I've made clear I don't feel in any way let down by Mr Russell because Mr Russell was always clear with the UK government that he wasn't the decision maker, that any decision on agreements that he discussed with us would have to be cleared by First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. He made that very clear. So we didn't think, oh, we've reached an agreement with the Scottish Government. We knew that an agreement had been discussed and Michael Russell would have to bring that back uh, to uh, the First Minister. So we were never... So I don't feel in any way, you know, let down or that, 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 there is a, that there's a lack of trust. And likewise, we were always very clear with Mr Russell uh, and indeed the Prime Minister was very clear with the First Minister what our position was. So I, d I don't think that there's been any uh, lack of, uh, you know, la lack of uh, trust in, uh, you know, in that regard. Now, the convener and I uh, both served in the period immediately prior to the independence referendum in 2014. Uh, you know, and my experience was certainly that intergovernmental relations uh, were much more difficult in that uh, period. In fact, practical dealings with the then First Minister were much more d difficult than they are with the current First Minister, because although we may disagree with her, uh, she always acts in a very, uh, in a very uh, professional 
uh, manner. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I, I do think these, you know, I, I think remarks, you know, that suggest that Jacob Rees-Mogg is suddenly going to start imposing uh, uh, regulations and rules uh, in Scotland at a point only two weeks after this parliament acknowledged that a large section of the welfare responsibilities for Scotland had been devolved mm. to it and that it would be able to create its own welfare system you know, are frankly ridiculous. The government's track record, this government, the previous coalition government, on uh, devolution is one uh, I am proud of. And I think you know, if you look last night in the House of Lords, Jim Wallace, the former dep uh, you know, Deputy First Minister of Scotland, a leading protagonist of devolution from the pre-convention onwards, said this government has a very strong commitment, and I say that from the opposition benches, through the number of things that they have devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Indeed. Um, so uh, you, you clarified there that in your view, um, the decision of the Scottish Government um, not to enter into the agreement with the United Kingdom government that the Welsh government have entered into is the personal decision of the First Minister herself? I'm not a uh, party to the, the, the First Minister's personal uh, decisions, but what I am clear on was that Mr Russell you know, was very clear that you know, any, any decision on the agreement which had been discussed between the Scottish government and the Welsh government would need uh, to be agreed with the First Minister. Can I take you to the amendments, um, uh, the government amendments on, to Clause 11 that were agreed without division in the House of Lords yesterday um, evening, um, and, um, uh, and the, the key amendment in Lord Callanan's name that um, reverses um, the effect of the original Clause 11. It reverses the presumption um, that underpinned that original Clause 11, and that the presumption, which was, in my judgment, um, as you know, incompatible with the devolution settlement, was the reason why um, the Scottish Conservatives joined with the, all of the other members of this committee in unanimously recommending uh, in our interim report on the withdrawal bill that Clause 11 needed to be removed or replaced. It seems to me that Clause 11 has now been replaced, and it's been replaced with a, a new clause which turns that presumption on its head. So the presumption is now that everything that falls within devolved competence will come directly um, to the Scottish Parliament um, uh, 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 on exit day. Um, uh, other than that, which is agreed by the government to need to be put temporarily into a holding pattern um, so that we can ensure that the integrity of the UK single market is not uh, th inadvertently threatened or jeopardised by um, different governments in these islands pulling in different directions in manners that would be adverse to the interests of the United Kingdom as a whole. Is it your understanding, Secretary of State and indeed Minister, um, that the new Clause 11, um, as, um, uh, as we can now call it, as from last night, um, copies and pastes um, one of the fundamental principles um, of our devolution settlement into the law. And that fundamental principle, of course, is the Sewell Convention. And the Sewell Convention is uh, that the Westminster Parliament will not normally legislate on devolved matters without the consent of this place. And that is the effect of the New Clause 11. The effect of the New Clause 11 is that uh, no power will be taken into that holding pattern normally without the consent of this place. And therefore, the new Clause 11, unlike the original Clause 11, is completely compatible with the devolution settlement. And that's why the Welsh have signed up to it. Is that, is that roughly your understanding of, of where we are? Yes, in combination with the intergovernmental yeah. uh, agreement, which further clarifies that. Yeah. Thank you. OK, Ashton. Thank you, Convener, Secretary of State. Uh, Minister, good morning. Um, Secretary of State, I have your letter here, um, dated the 2nd of May, um, and in it, it obviously goes through some of the amendments, um, and particularly I'd like to ask you about this new term that's appeared, which is the one consent decision. So could you explain for the committee what a consent decision consists of? A consent decision is a decision uh, that this parliament would make in relation uh, to a, a proposal which had been made by the UK government. And in, reach, you know, in making that decision, a, um, there are three, uh, d there are three uh, specifics uh, that the, uh, the Parliament uh, could do. Obviously, it could agree, it could not agree, or uh, it could move forward a, a specific motion of refusal. And those are the three uh, decisions 
uh, which would then signify that the Parliament had dealt within the 40-day period with consideration uh, of such a proposal. So, just to clarify, a consent decision is where the Scottish Parliament either consents, declines to make a decision, or refuses consent. So, even if the Scottish Parliament, even if every single MSP in this Parliament takes a decision to not to consent, to refuse consent to the UK government, the UK government would still take that as a consent decision? No. We, it, no, in, in the sense, uh, uh, I, th I think, of suggesting that the Parliament had consented, of course we wouldn't uh, take that as... But that's uh, what it says. No, it, does, um, it, do, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that with respect. It does with, say with, that. It says respect. that a refusal will be taken as a consent decision. How yeah. can a refusal be consent? Because a consent decision isn't the same as consent. A consent decision is a decision in relation to consent, which can either be yes or no, or a specific refusal. So if you follow what is to happen in that, in a, uh, a light of such an event, and say every member of this parliament voted against, there would then have to be if, if, if they would then have to be uh, within the UK Parliament, the UK government would have to bring forward a proposal uh, that 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 uh, uh, that we we proceeded without that uh, consent. Yes. Uh, the uh, uh, as part of that process, there would be a laying of an order, uh, a laying of a report uh, from the Scottish government, setting out why. Uh, that consent had not uh, been forthcoming, and making clear the fact that every uh, member uh, of this parliament had voted against it. And then there would have to be a vote in the House of, uh, both houses of parliament to confirm that the uh, regulations could go ahead in those circumstances. Yes, so a refusal would be taken as consent by the UK government. No, that, yes, no, that is exactly what no, you just said. You I, I, said I'm, it in a roundabout I'm, way, I, I, I'm, but that I'm, I'm is what you sorry, said. No, I'm, so it's not consent, what... Well, excuse let's, me, Secretary of State. OK, well, consent let's be clear. Consent is a founding principle of the devolution settlement. Do you understand that? Of course I understand that, because I have been a member, uh, Ms Denham, of this uh, parliament. But I, I, I don't want you to misrepresent what I said. I said that there is a definition of a term called consent decision. That is a decision which is made on consent. And clearly, a decision which is made on consent can be yes or no. The government is not going to, and let's be absolutely clear, the legislation is absolutely clear, the government is not going to suggest that because every member of the Scottish Parliament had voted against uh, a, a motion that it had consented to it. What it would take is that within the 40-day period allowed, the Scottish Parliament had made a decision. That decision would then be the subject of the procedure set out in, uh, set out in relation to uh, what could then happen in, in the Houses of Parliament. Secretary of State, in your own letter to this committee dated yesterday, it says the UK Government, in the event of the um, circumstances we were just discussing, must explain its reasons for proceeding in the absence of consent. The UK government can now proceed in the absence of the consent of this parliament. That is not compatible with the devolution settlement. Surely you must see that. Uh, no, I, I, I don't see that because the devolution settlement, as is currently set out, does not, uh, does not set out uh, an absolute uh, uh, consent uh, arrangement. That is not within uh, the current uh, devolution a uh, settlement. What we're, what we're seeking to do is to find a way forward where agreement can't be reached. And that is the proposal uh, that we have put forward, which allows and ensures that the consent of the Scottish Parliament is sought uh, within, uh, and there is a time period, if, if uh, the 40-day time period, the Scottish Parliament will then have the opportunity to debate, discuss the decision. It can agree, it can not agree. If it doesn't agree, then uh, that, uh, uh, the reasons for not agreeing uh, will, ha will be laid before uh, MPs and peers before there is any uh, vote in the Scottish Parliament, in, in the UK Parliament. When did you know that this consent decision was going to be a feature of these amendments, and did you sign off on this personally? I am quite happy uh, with uh, that 
uh, clause uh, because it is one uh, which uh, the Welsh uh, Labour government have been able uh, to agree. Uh, it's one uh, with which the uh, uh, Liberal Democrat and Labour peers within the, the House of Commons were able uh, to agree. It was a clause that was shared with uh, the Scottish Government. I'm not suggesting uh, that uh, uh, they signed off on uh, the clause, but that, but that clause was shared with Scottish Government uh, officials in the discussions that we had with Mr Russell. As the Secretary of State for Scotland, I think it is very disappointing that you feel that you're quite happy with this, because obviously this Parliament is the democratically elected voice of Scotland, if you like. And it seems to me that through this process, you are effectively completely ignoring the voice of Scotland. Are you comfortable with that, Secretary of State? Well, obviously, Ms Denham, we are fundamentally in disagreement because I believe Scotland has two parliaments. Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom Parliament represents Scotland, as does this Parliament. This Parliament is not the sole voice of Scotland. It is a very, very important voice on the matters. Uh, and clearly has responsibility for the matters that are devolved to it. And indeed, it has a very important role in discussing and uh, influencing in matters that are not devolved to it. But no, fundamentally, I respect the, t the settlement which the people of Scotland voted for in the 2014 referendum that Scotland ha is part of the United Kingdom and that Scotland has two parliaments. Okay, we'll move on to Patrick Harvey. Thank you, uh, convener. Good morning. I wanted to continue to explore the, the issues uh, of consent. Uh, I, I think I would just uh, ask you, first of all, in, in relation to the, uh, the, the, the part of the uh, recent amendments that were passed that Ash Denham was exploring with you, uh, it could certainly have been presented better, couldn't it? It does look uh, to a, a lot of people as though that term, consent decision, uh, means something very different than I think you intend it to mean. It could have been presented a lot better, couldn't it? I, I'm always uh, willing to take uh, advice and feedback on uh, improved uh, uh, presentation. What, is, what does consent mean then, in general terms? What does it mean to ask someone <coughs> for their consent? We're seeking in terms, and when we seek the legislative consent, uh, of uh, uh, this Parliament, as we uh, have done on uh, numerous uh, occasions, we are seeking agreement, and and we are, uh, and that's what we're doing uh, in relation to this bill. We're seeking the agreement uh, of this Parliament to the provisions of this bill that relate uh, you know, to the powers and responsibilities of Scottish Parliament, Scottish ministers. Isn't it pretty clear that to ask for consent? is a very clear signal that you need consent. Your neighbour comes and knocks on your door and says, David, look, mate, can I borrow your phone? It means that they don't have a right to come in and take your phone and use it. They need your consent. Isn't that what consent means? It's, a, it's an indication that it's the other person's decision to make, not your own to impose. Well, I, I, I see it as in terms of reaching, uh, of te in terms of reaching uh, agreement, uh, in terms uh, of uh, being able to proceed uh, on an agreed basis. But I don't, in the terms that we're discussing it, Mr Harvey, I don't believe that it is absolute and that it has not been uh, in uh, terms mm. of, of the devolution uh, settlement. But we have uh, abided by that, uh, by the Sewell Convention. We have sought uh, convention. We, are, uh, we sought consent. We're clear uh, within the provisions here that we will continue uh, to do uh, that, uh, that and operate in exactly that manner. And we've, you know, you may think the drafting uh, of uh, the amendment is uh, imperfect, but uh, what we've sought to do is to continue to, to be, for our approach to be founded on uh, that consent principle. But it does have to recognise in these unprecedented circumstances that there may be occasion where agreement is not. Reached, and there has to be, there has to be a mechanism for going forward where agreement is not reached. I'll, I'll, I'll be polite about the drafting of the amendment and agree that it's merely imperfect. Um, the, the word "normally" raises its its head here. The word "normally" has been part of the, the Sewell Convention, and I think is what you're uh, referring to when you you say that there has to be a, a possibility of proceeding 
without consent. Um, the principle that the UK Parliament or the UK Government won't uh, legislate in devolved areas normally. Aren't we really at the, at the point where we're having to define what that means? Aren't we really dancing around a fudge that that always represented? Uh, I think most people would accept that in some kind of absolute national emergency, it might be necessary to say the devolution arrangements can't be relied upon here. We can't proceed with those, those normal arrangements. So some other option has to exist. Brexit may well be uh, a crisis, a political crisis, uh, but I don't think we would suggest that it's the kind of national emergency that prevents the devolution arrangements from working as they normally do. Don't we need to define clearly what normally means? And wouldn't that be a better approach to your amendment to this bill, uh, that uh, if consent has been given, uh, some additional threshold, threshold or test needs to be reached, uh, that some, cr some crisis or emergency is taking place, which means that we can't rely uh, on the devolution principles? I think it's, uh, that's you know, an interesting line of, of argument, and I think uh, Professor Tompkins and many other academics have uh, um, considered those matters. They were certainly considered um, in the Article uh, 50 uh, hearing before a, uh, the Supreme uh, Court, uh, who made clear that, that the I, um, the, the Seoul Convention, as, as presently set out, wasn't judiciable I, uh, in relation to, I, um, in, in relation to I, the determination of, of, of normally. Normally was very extensively debated at the p point of the passing uh, of a, um, the Scotland Bill, but a definitive, uh, a definitive position wasn't uh, um, reached in terms of having uh, that specific definition for the very reason that you allude to in terms of uh, allowing, uh, allowing a flexibility to take account of, of circumstances. I mean, to, to use my, my, my metaphor, I think most people would accept that uh, if your neighbour knocks on your door to borrow your phone and you say no, but he wants your phone because there's some crisis, not just because he's forgotten his keys, there's some emergency outside and needs to phone the fire brigade, the police, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. You know, he's probably got a, a reasonable call to say, look, I'm pushing you out the way, I'm going to use your phone because people are going to die out here. In a crisis like that, it might be reasonable to proceed without consent. Uh, but out with those kind of situations, out with a national emergency, surely the principle has to be that consent must be freely given or withheld without coercion, without threat, that it has to be revocable if a person changes their mind, or in this case, if a, if a devolved authority with its own democratic legitimacy changes its mind, uh, and most fundamentally, it has to be respected. Your amendment in this fails to achieve those three principles of what consent means in any reasonable use of the word. I don't uh, accept. Uh, that because we, you know, we've proceeded over the past 19 years on exactly uh, the basis that you've set out and we uh, intend to go forward uh, on exactly that basis. Whether what we we've yes done, no, what, what we've done though, is to set out in these, uh, 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 what I regard as unique circumstances because I, I think uh, uh, as many uh, members of the House of Lords it indicated in, in the debate that they had uh, last night, these weren't circumstances which were ever contemplated in uh, the framing of the initial uh, devolution settlement. There has to be some form of mechanism to deal with a situation where agreement isn't reached. If I, um, if I may, Mr Harvey, just on, on your analogy, um, and uh, convener, thank you for my presence in front of the committee. I'm, I'm pleased to be here also. Um, Mr Harvey, I, th I think in your analogy, there's a couple of things, two, two further points I would, I would make to it. First of all, and picking up what Ms Denham's line of questioning uh, seemed to be about, I think, it's, I think we do risk uh, in those two exchanges having a misrepresentation of what the amendments uh, that have now been accepted by the House of Lords actually do. This whole idea of describing a consent decision. What we have had to do to get the words on the page to make this make this this uh, uh, workable 
uh, law is simply to describe the three options that can come about out or out of a decision. Mm -hmm. So if you like, the knock on the door can, of course, result in the door opening and the person saying yes, the door opening and the person saying no, or the door refusing to open at all. Now, that is simply what we are doing, and I just want to make absolutely clear, in the terms of your analogy, Mr Harvey, that that is all that that consent decision uh, terminology refers to. It is part of a process in which, in your analogy, is the knocking on the door. Now, I do think it's rather valuable to have the knock on the door uh, uh, valued, and that's what, of course, the Secretary of State has been uh, uh, driving at and, and is, of course, what underpins all of our work here. But the other thing, I think, is this. If we also applied your analogy to uh, the subject matter that we're actually talking about, which, of course, is uh, the 24 matters in the uh, long, uh, long done piece of work that, that is referred to as, as frameworks, um, really, the knock on the door actually is coming for things that are where there is already agreement that there should be working together. And I'm referring there to the agreement that came out of JMCEN in October, the principles that guide the framework, and subsequent points that have been made in, in the public sphere by all sides to say that actually, yes, we agree, there are these things on which we know we're going to need to work together in the future, and that all starts with the knock on the door. So long well, as the knock on the door isn't with a sledgehammer. Great. Okay, we'll move on. James. In response to Mr Harvey, you said that um, where agreement couldn't be reached, there needs to be a mechanism for resolving that dispute, which is ab absolutely correct. However, can you understand in terms of what you're outlining in relation to the amendments which have been put forward and agreed uh, at the House of Lords by the government, that the, the, the mechanism for resolving the dispute between the two parliaments basically is to take the issue back to the floor of the House of Commons and therefore uh, it seems as if there's a you know there's a an unequal uh, settlement in terms of resolving that issue of disagreement between the two parliaments I think um, you know if we look at uh, what you know your colleagues in, 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 you know, in Wales uh, have concluded in what you know, many uh, people who have been very prominent supporters of devolution uh, in the past uh, have said. They have taken a view that, this, that, that what has been set out is a fair and reasonable uh, approach, recognising you know, the existing constitutional arrangements. Now, I fully accept and, uh, that you know, there are people around this table in particular who don't agree the existing constitutional arrangements, and of course they're not required to, 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 uh, to do so as such, but they are the arrangements uh, um, uh, that are uh, in place, and they do come down you know, to the fact, which uh, people in Scotland have endorsed in the, the referendum 2014, of the sovereignty of the, of, of the Westminster Parliament. I understand the legal position that you set out, however, in terms of trying to resolve this specific issue about retain EU law and how it's allocated between the two parliaments. The position that you've set out for resolving the dispute basically uh, allows the, the power for that resolution to be on the floor of the House of Commons. And therefore, uh, I mean, I say to you as a, as a supporter of the devolution process, uh, it puts those of us that are defending that process in a position uh, of you know, examining a set of amendments which essentially are, are unequal in relation to resolving a, a dispute? Well, I, I, I don't accept that uh, uh, analysis, partly for the reasons that I, that I set out in my you know, answer to Ms uh, Denham's question. The, the House of Commons has 59 Scottish members. The House of Commons represents Scotland. Scotland uh, is part of the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom Parliament uh, speaks for Scotland uh, in that uh, in, in, in that regard. And I, I think uh, you know that is a fundamental part of, of our uh, constitutional uh, arrangement. What the government has uh, been very clear and what is set out is a commitment on every occasion to seek uh, consent. A, a commitment to go through a very detailed process if that uh, consent in the form of a consent decision is not 
uh, forthcoming to allow an opportunity for the Scottish Government uh, to put its case in relation uh, to why, uh, um, uh, why uh, the consent has been withheld and why it should continue to be withheld before there is a vote of all members uh, of a, uh, both uh, parliaments. So it's not a, you know, it's not a case of, of railroading. But I think we do need to just come back to focus on the fact, and, and a, a convener alluded to the fact that other things could be added, but you, know, there are t the, you had a list before this, this committee of 111 things that were returning from Brussels. Now, over 80 of those things are not on the list of things that will be requiring UK legislative frameworks. I used to be asked routinely, uh, name one thing that's uh, coming back to the Scottish Parliament. I didn't because I respected the negotiations that w which were ongoing. But we've come to a position where, in a specific uh, set of areas, 24 out of 111 things have been determined as being appropriate for these UK-wide frameworks. We actually agree what they are. Uh, and Mr Russell's quite clear on that. We agree what those things are. Uh, what things those things are. So what we're now having this discussion about is how we formally agree something that we've already uh, agreed. And I think we do just need to understand that context as well. Alexander, I was going to come to you next, but the Secretary of State has introduced the issue of the, the, the 24. And I know that Ivan was wanting some clarity on that. So Ivan, can we just go to that now and then we'll come yeah, to Alexander? Yeah, um, thanks, thanks convener, and uh, good morning. Um, so you, you've mentioned um, Secretary of State and Ms Smith's mentioned as well on a number of occasions this list of 24 powers. Um, is it true to say that there is nothing in the legislation that prevents the UK government adding to that list? It's the case that um, it's the case that uh, it, it's the case that we actually already uh, are in agreement about what that list. Uh, contains. So given that actually I know this, I, I have already heard this morning how passionate this committee is around agreement, I think actually there's a point to be uh, respectful of there that, uh, that in fact we already do have that agreement of what that list um, uh, uh, consists of. The, the legislation that we are putting forward is then merely the tool to process that agreement. But uh, the legislation is a tool, but the tool doesn't reflect the fact that those 24 have been agreed. So I think your answer to my question, if I'm correct, is that there is nothing in the legislation that prevents that list of 24 being added to. The, the legislation, as I say, is, 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 merely a, is merely a tool. It's merely a functional thing. Clearly, the, the, the legislation uh, operates in the way to say that those things that are specified are dealt with in, in a certain way. Um, as the Secretary of State actually already uh, uh, reminded us, the legislation has to be taken in accompaniment with the um, IGA, the memo that goes with it. And between those two things you have, I think, a very uh, clear uh, uh, legislative and political commitment from the UK government as to how it would like to deal with right. the So I'll uh, give you the opportunity the again to answer the question. Is there anything in the legislation that prevents the UK government adding to that list of 24? Yes or no? The, the legislation, as I say, is there to process what is in the agreed list. And so uh, we have uh, an analysis of what is in that agreed list. We have, I think we have all actually been uh, very clear and open that that agreed list can evolve. Uh, and we actually have, have seen that, that happen already. I think uh, I would actually characterise that as a positive thing. I mean, forgive me, Mr McKee, I'm preempting your next question here, which is no doubt going to be, well, um, you know, what, what, if, what if things were added? Um, and, and to which I would say, actually, the, the whole point is the analysis um, is evolving, and that is in its own way a mark of good quality work between the administrations, between uh, actually all, all four of the administrations, and I include Wales and, and Northern Ireland um, so in that. We'll take that as a no. Um, you're oh, correct, my, you, you can answer that question, but you're correct my next question, which is the, um, if the UK government so decides to add to that list, how would that process work? Okay. Well, there's, I think there's two things here. So uh, first of all, 
the uh, let's talk about the the work that is known as frameworks, the frameworks analysis. So, so to give it its full name, that's the breakdown of the areas uh, of EU law that intersect with devolved competence. That's what we're that's what we're talking about. Uh, the 24 is 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 the, the kind of common common word for the areas where we we uh, believe legislative action would be would be needed to be able to create um, workable UK frameworks. Uh, uh, sorry, frameworks that require uh, legislation. Um, so, uh, as I say, that, that work has already been the subject of, uh, of, of very long and, I would say, good quality discussion between uh, administrations. That in itself um, implies the answer to, to your question, that that has already been possible to discuss and to evolve and then to change uh, upon discussion. Um, the second uh, answer to your question is, is, as I say, then, the legislation is simply the tool to process uh, the um, uh, those of that list that, 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 that we are indeed agreed in thinking require legislative solutions. Right, so can I try to work my way through that? I think what you're saying is that the UK government can add to the list of 24 as it sees fit. Well, I think, to be fair, so could the Scottish government if it wanted to. In discussion, I'm talking about the framework's analysis, which as, as I... remove things from the list? As I hope you've, I mean, as I hope you've, you've obviously gone into the frameworks analysis in, in quite some detail. The whole point I've just been making to you is that between the administrations, the so contents the of Scottish that list has been a matter of discussion. So, so, so I'm clear to say that. So you're saying the Scottish government can alter what's on this list without the consent of the UK government? Uh, no, you are you are altering my words in turn. What I'm very clearly saying to you is that the, sub the contents of the framework's analysis has been indubitably a matter of discussion and agreement between the administrations. I think actually that really stands as a good record of the work of the officials of all the governments. And actually, I think it ought to be congratulated. I think they ought to be congratulated for the work they've done um, to, to bring it to this point. As I say, we, we regard it then as uh, possible to evolve further. Um, and I think as, I mean, in, in line with the comments we've been, we've been making all morning, the UK government would be very much open to, to the Scottish uh, government being able to, to join in agreement of the overall package here. But notwithstanding the, the, the other parts of the package, that, that detailed work on the frameworks analysis conti continues, right, as so, it should. But I, th I think, uh, uh, just so that we're clear in terms of the, of the context yeah, of the helps. discussion, Mr McKee, you, you've got the intergovernmental agreement, because mm. you, this committee should have sight of, of, of that. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about the legislation. Right, OK. Uh, uh, there, was, there was extensive discussion and debate as to whether the frame, details of the frameworks mm. should be in the legislation. And I mean, I think the view which was taken uh, across the, the three governments when we were in that, you know, that type of negotiation was that it would not be helpful to do so because that would create a definitive list that could then only be amended by primary legislation and that therefore for the flexibility uh, that was required uh, going forward and based on the fact, uh, going right back to the convener's first question, that actually in these discussions there has been a very strong level of trust across the three governments and indeed with the input from Northern Ireland Executive, uh, that, that that was the better way in which uh, to, uh, to take this forward. But there is an argument, and some would make that argument, that the whole detail should be on the face of primary legislation. I'm just trying to establish, legislation. Try to establish the facts, and the facts, as far as I can gather from your answers, um, are that the list of 24 can be added to, and it can be added to by the UK government without the consent of the Scottish government or the Scottish Parliament. I think that's, if I'm understanding that. But it would not be in status. accordance with the. It would not be in accordance with the intergovernmental agreement which we have committed to and which we will abide by. But the legislation doesn't. It's not that. on the face of the legislation right. because so, the view is strongly. Uh, that by putting it on the face of primary legislation, you limit the flexibility to go forward both ways. So the areas we're talking about here in this 24 make it a bit more real for people. Areas where, as we've already established, the UK government doesn't need, only needs to ask for consent, doesn't need to gain consent uh, from the, the Scottish Parliament, include GM crops, uh, includes food safety, includes public procurement, um, which are obviously potentially very key issues um, in 
uh, in Scotland. Um, the list of the, the rest of the list of 111 includes areas like onshore hydrocarbons, i.e., fracking, which could, at the whim of the UK government, also be added to this list to be subject to clause 11. I think that is an alarmist statement well, made, because we've made it absolutely clear that we have devolved the responsibility for fracking to this parliament. This parliament makes the decision as to whether there is fracking in Scotland and any suggestion that it could be uh, changed by sleight of hand it, you know, it, it is, is disingenuous because well, it is not so uh, correct. And in relation, let's just be absolutely clear because I wanted to make it clear in my letter and it's something that doesn't come across always clearly in the discussion. What is going to happen in relation to the 24 uh, areas is that by the arrangements in this bill, they will stay exactly as they are today. There will be no change. That's what it means. It will mean that things will stay exactly as they are across the whole of the UK. So it's not that the regu So everybody needs to be absolutely clear. This isn't about bringing forward new and different frameworks or regulations to change agricultural support or to change uh, areas that you have uh, just uh, alluded to. It's about, for a period, to allow discussion on new and different arrangements to freeze what we have at the moment. So after this legislation was passed, and in the areas that the government brought forward regulation, nothing would change. Well, it would change because over a period of time, common frameworks would be imposed, I'll use the word, because consent isn't required, we've established that, by the UK government. Well, co common fr the methodology of agreeing for common frameworks is not set out in this bill or in the intergovernmental agreement. Yeah, what it's saying is that consent isn't required for that. No, no it's not saying that. That, that is well, not what it's can, saying. Can I, can I just, just, just for, 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 for clarity, and first of all, th thank you for, in terms of the intergovernmental agreement and the commitment you just made about there have been, in, in your yes. view, Quite definitively, there'd be no, nothing added to that without agreement uh -huh. and of the uh, Scottish well, government. I think, I just, I, sorry, I just want to make one important point, Mr Crawford, to clarify as well. Yeah. Even if we weren't able to get agreement with the Scottish government, we would abide by the terms of the intergovernmental agreement as to how so, it was intended to apply so the, so the uh, word, in Scotland. So the word normally doesn't apply here then? Well, it said no, the word normally does apply in the, in, in the intergovernmental Oh, it, it, it does say so, that. So what you're saying is normally th th there'd be no circumstances in which you would add to this list. We wouldn't add to that list without agreement with, uh, uh, on the basis of the, of the terms of the agreement. We which, wouldn't, which, which is normally or not? Well, it, 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 well the agreement is, is predicated on not normally, so right, that's so. we wouldn't normally add to yeah, the right. list without the agreement of the Scottish Government and Welsh yeah, Government. But, but, okay, so it all comes back to where this normally issue that Patrick Harvey raised. Alexander. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Camilla. Uh, yeah, we, we've heard since yeah, August last year about how close the Scottish and Welsh governments were, uh, and we've heard Mike Russell on numerous uh, times uh, talk about being in lockstep with, with the Welsh government and being in exactly the same position. I won't repeat all the uh, quotes uh, over the last eight months. So a lot of it was re uh, given and uh, recorded on the record yesterday. Uh, so can I just ask why the Secretary of State's thinks that this deal is good enough for the Welsh, but not good enough for us? Well, I do think it's good enough for, uh, uh, for you. I think it's good. I think it's a good deal for Scotland. I think it's a good deal um, uh, in relation to the Scottish Government and, and Scottish Parliament. And you know, were very close. You know, we were uh, very close to getting uh, agreement. I, I don't understand, you know, having uh, said so often a, um, that a, there was a um, uh, that the Welsh and Scottish governments had absolutely common uh, interests. Uh, that the that the, that the view is now that that they don't, uh, because uh, Mark Drakeford, who is has negotiated these matters on part of the Welsh government and is prospectively the first minister of Wales and therefore a, a potentially a very significant figure in. Uh, devolved uh, uh, arrangements across the UK is quite clear that this arrangement protects the devolution settlement as it currently exists. Now, I know some people want to change that and <coughs> therefore wouldn't be happy with an arrangement in the context of devolution, but this is an arrangement in the context of the devolution settlement 
as we have. So I, I don't know. I don't think you know the sort of language that uh, you know, Pete Wishart uh, used about the Welsh Labour Party capitulating to the uh, Tory UK government. Uh, you know, is, is helpful uh, language. I, I don't think. That, I mean, that just doesn't characterise the negotiations. These were complicated. There were serious negotiations. There are a lot of very uh, you know dif uh, difficult issues. Uh, innovative issues to approach, such as the one Mr. McKee uh, raised, as to whether you know its issues should be on the f uh, on the face of the bill, whether there should be intergovernmental agreements, memorandums of understanding, you know, a whole range of issues. But we felt that uh, we had moved very significantly, and I think you know all objective commentators accept the UK government has moved very significantly from uh, the initial Clause 11, taken on board the flaws in that initial uh, clause that this uh, 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 committee com uh, uh, concluded were there. Uh, uh, we wouldn't necessarily have seen it that way, but uh, we took on board what this committee said, Committee of Welsh Assembly, committees of the House of Commons, House of Lords, individual uh, MPs, and change substantially. We, we reverse the clause with the presumption of devolution so that powers will come back unless they fall within uh, this category. We found we agreed the powers that would be in the category, and now we're left with not being able to agree how we actually just do that formally. Thank you. Again, just for clarity, uh, Secretary of State, uh, on the 24th of April, uh, Mark Drakeford wrote to uh, David Ledington and in, in, in his letter, I just wonder if you confirm that in his letter he said, I would prefer such arrangements to have been developed without the need for legislative constraints, with respective governments trusting each other's undertakings not to legislate in areas where we agree UK wide frameworks are needed until they've been agreed. So that takes us right back to my initial question to you, because actually that's the preferred Welsh position. But, um, convener, we've been in a situation where we've been seeking agreement, where each yeah, side, exactly. each yeah, each of three parties, and, and with the complexities of Northern Ireland, were seeking to reach agreement. And agreement does mean compromise, a bit of given, uh, a, a give, and, give and take. A huge effort was put into getting a clause, a, uh, a, an agreement, and a memorandum uh, of understanding. And in all the circumstances, Mr Drakeford and Carwin Jones uh, and Welsh uh, Labour uh, peers concluded that the arrangement that had been reached was fair and reasonable in all the circumstances and did protect the devolution settlement. I accept that. And would you also accept, though, that, that the preferred position of the Welsh Government, as I have indicated in the letter that was given from Mark Drakeford to David Linton? Well... Obviously, I accept that that letter is a fact, but I also accept that agreement has been reached, and where agreement is required to be concluded, it requires compromises on all sides. Uh, Neil? Um, just, um, just to follow up the issue about the... Um, d just to clarify on the issue of uh, common frameworks and um, the imposition of frameworks, uh, the UK government stated that you would not impose a framework on, on Scotland and uh, Secretary of State, you've been clear you do not want the frameworks to be imposed. Uh, Mike Russell said yesterday it was still feasible um, that a framework could be imposed. Um, what examples are there what, what, uh, where there would be justification for the UK government to impose a framework? Uh, and what is stopping the UK government giving a guarantee that no uh, frameworks will be imposed? Well, I have already indicated that we are not in the business of imposing frameworks. But as I said in my um, answer to previous questions, the, con the agreeing and negotiating of frameworks is a separate issue from this bill. This bill is about identifying 24 areas in which everything will stay the same when we leave the EU across the UK. And that's what it's about. It's then, in the period after we've left the EU, the opportunity to agree frameworks involving the Scottish Government, Welsh Government, a Northern Ireland Executive, we hope is up and running, and UK Government, on, on how we approach um, these frameworks uh, going forward. 
but we are not in the business, and I wanted to make clear in, my pre in previous remarks, that where something was, was, was characterised as a UK framework, that didn't in itself mean that this was a framework that the UK government had come up with and everybody had to go along with it. We see that as a collaborative process, a process in which uh, we reach agreement. If I may just to, to add, I, th I think it, it would help if I just refer the committee back to, to the, um, the agreement for in, in 16th of October last year, in which actually the principles for what would define a framework are set out. And I think, Mr Bibby, this is actually in, in large part the answer to your question. You say, well, what, what's the criterion for, for having a, a framework? What are the circumstances for having a framework? And actually all of the uh, administrations have, have agreed those circumstances, and here they are in, in principles. Common frameworks will be established where they are necessary in order to enable the functioning of the UK internal market whilst acknowledging policy divergence, ensure compliance with international obligations, ensure the UK can negotiate, enter into and implement new trade agreements and international treaties, enable the management of common resources, administer and provide access to justice in cases with a cross-border element, and safeguard the security of the UK. So I'm, I'm reading out there from a list which was the communique from 16th of October 2017, where uh, all um, those who've been party to, to, to this work, which includes, as we say, civil servants in Northern Ireland, uh, have uh, agreed those are the principles that, that should govern frameworks. I mean, if there's agreement, that's fine, obviously. Um, you said you're not in the business of imposing frameworks. If you're not in the business of imposing frameworks, what's stopping you giving a guarantee that you won't impose a framework? Well, I've, I've said that we're not you know, we're not seeking to impose a um, frameworks. What we are seeking to do is to find a mechanism by which uh, we can agree uh, those frameworks, and that's, some, that, that's uh, the next stage uh, of uh, this process, which we discussed at the JMCN uh, yesterday. How are we going to come uh, about uh, th those agreements? And that's uh, about officials Working together, we believe uh, it's also uh, important to have some uh, civic um, engagement as well, uh, so that when, for example, new, if, if there is to be a discussion around new arrangements for um, agriculture, for example, then the agricultural community is you know, involved in that discussion as well. But th that's what we want to. That's what we want to take forward with the Scottish government, Welsh government. Uh, and hopefully an all Ireland executive, is how, uh, how these frameworks will be developed. And, and actually, to, to add to that point, civil society has quite rightly already uh, entered into this debate. For example, you hear uh, voices from the Scottish food and drink sector, the Scottish retail sector, uh, reminding us of how important it is to be able to have those ways to, to keep the internal market uh, uh, functioning well, thriving, prospering, because ultimately that is what causes, uh, create, creates and maintains jobs for, for the people we all represent uh, and um, gives consumers uh, the prices and choices that they would look for. I also want to ask you about the, the, the time frame, um, the sunset clause of up to, to seven years. Um, Mike Russell has expressed concern about, about that time frame. Is that... Is that non-negotiable? Is there movement from the, could there be movement from the UK government on that in the well, next view? Obviously, oh, well, ob obviously that that area was a matter for negotiation um, in in the discussions that took place, you know, in the agreement that uh, the Welsh government accepted and that the Scottish government didn't. But my understanding from Mr. Russell, and and you know, I'm happy to be um, corrected on that, was that his. Uh, issues with Clause 11 were now so fundamental that a change in respect of that uh, uh, time period wouldn't lead to the Scottish Government agreeing it. But if uh, uh, that is not the case, uh, then uh, uh, you know, in the, in, in the way that we've characterised that our doors open, then of course it's open. May I add a few points on, on the, the sunset power? Um, I mean, the first is to say that, of course, the, the numbers involved, the idea of two, two and three, have just had a good debate in the House of Lords only last night, uh, and, and agreement was, was reached, no, 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 no division was, was had on that point. So I think that's, that's withstood the test of debate there. Um, second is to say that, uh, again, actually, as we've been, been mentioning in other, in other answers, 
in themselves, those, those numbers are the mark of compromise. You know, we, we have, the, the UK government has, uh, through discussion with the, with the, the, the Welsh government and, and, of course, the Scottish government, although crucially agreement with the Gel Welsh government, uh, been able to come to, come to, to, to those terms, and we, we think they are uh, sensible and helpful. And, and the thing that they are sensible and helpful in doing is providing certainty and stability for uh, citizens and businesses, wh which is what this entire bill is for. Uh, they are, of course, about how, the, uh, how these really important matters will function on exit day and beyond. And the third point to add to that, we were speaking uh, in terms of saying that um, uh, frameworks here are actually about keeping many things the same, and that's absolutely correct. But, of course, the five-year sunset reminds us that they are kept the same for a period, and then after that, it will rightly be a matter for, uh, after a maximum of that, it will rightly be a matter for uh, devolved administrations to be able to plot their own course if they wish to. Emma, now I know you were interested in this area, but I don't know if all these quite answers have been provided have yeah, thank concluded you. your area, or you want to just well, a question? Well, I, I am, a lot of the que questions that I thought about have been asked already right. around common frameworks, but mm -hmm. I'm interested in just an issue around uh, a Barnett formula and under current EU cap, 16% of cap funding is what's delivered right now. But under Barnett formula, it will be 8%. So that's obviously a massive reduction for um, farmers uh, if we are moving forward. And as far as the other questions, um, that would be one issue I have. Will you guarantee that Scottish farmers, crofters and growers won't be adversely affected on exit day? And, you know, should we be expecting you know, chlorinated chicken and hormone-injected beef on our supermarket shelves? I mean, that is a, a true concern from the National Farmers Union in Scotland and others. I think the reassurance I can uh, um, give you, Emma, is that, firstly, as we've set out, the arrangements uh, in uh, the bill are about keeping the existing arrangements in place uh, at the point that we leave uh, the EU, and that, that's generally in terms of agricultural, uh, in terms of agricultural uh, regulation. The issue of what few, the, the government has guaranteed funding uh, of agriculture on the same basis as it is now for the duration of the current UK uh, Parliament. But going forward, there's no, no decision has been made uh, about a, uh, the, the nature uh, of a uh, future uh, UK uh, uh, and indeed Scottish uh, funding for uh, agriculture. But as you would imagine, I am a very, very strong advocate for the continued support uh, of agriculture because I understand the vital role uh, that it plays in the economy and uh, the uh, civil uh, society of uh, so much of Scotland. But no, the, the, there's no suggestion you know, that, that agricultural funding is going to be uh, barnetised, for example. Okay, okay. I, I, I recognise where time's marching on. I've got two people still to, to be, be, who, who want to ask questions. Murdo first and then Willie. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I wanted to um, understand the legal effect of the bill uh, as it now exists with the amendments that have been passed in the House of Lords uh, last night. My, my reading of the bill was it applies only to EU retained law. In other words, laws and, and powers exercised currently at an EU level uh, will return to the UK uh, post-Brexit. But there have been various suggestions made that, um, in fact, what this bill will do is a, a, allow a power grab. It will allow powers which are currently being exercised by the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament to be exercised at a, at a Westminster level. Can, can you just make it clear for our benefit where exactly the truth lies? It's absolutely the case that every power and responsibility currently exercised by this Parliament will continue to be exercised the day after we leave the EU and thereafter. And there is absolutely no evidence or legal basis uh, to suggest uh, otherwise. And indeed, uh, and maybe I should have taken some tips from Mr Harvey on presentation. I haven't landed the fact, uh, as well as I would have wished, that the Parliament will have a range of additional uh, powers which are coming from that list of 111, 
at, immediately after we leave without any uh, involvement or a, uh, from the UK uh, government. But there are these 24 areas where we are agreed that it would be better that we continued as we are at the moment, enforced at the moment by the EU, uh, with arrangements that applied across <coughs> either the whole of the UK or Great Britain. OK, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. And just one follow-up question, if I can, just to, to illustrate this. Uh, and Ivan McKee already referred to this briefly in his questioning. Uh, yesterday, when Michael Russell was sitting, where you're sitting now, he gave the examples of GM crops and fracking as two areas where he was concerned that powers were to be taken to Westminster. Now, as it happens, I think on both these issues, we should go with evidence and science and not with superstition and scaremongering when it comes to policy making. But I also believe that it is appropriate in terms of the devolution settlement that these decisions are taken here uh, in the Scottish Parliament and not at Westminster. So can you give us an assurance that uh, we are not going to see uh, decisions over GM crops and fracking in Scotland made at a Westminster level because uh, we, all we're talking about refers only to EU retained law? Absolutely. Thank you. Convener, Mr Mandel, I wonder if I could just return to the discussion on consent decision that we had earlier. Um, the Scotland Act and the whole devolution settlement, as far as I understand it, has no mention of this principle or notion of consent decision. Uh, the whole agreement between the UK government and the devolved administrations is based on reaching agreement with the, the parliaments. Do, do, you, do you honestly think that introducing this new notion of consent decision has strengthened the devolution settlement, or would you agree that there's a risk that people will consider that it's weakened the devolution settlement? I don't think that anybody whose objective will conclude uh, that it's a, a weakened a, uh, the devolution settlement. And you know, I take someone uh, like uh, Lord Mackay of Clashfern, who's uh, been cited regularly by, I think, both Mr Russell and the First Minister. And in last night's debate, he said, I think this is a reasonable arrangement and the best we can achieve. I, do think the UK, I, I don't think the UK government can do any better than this. They've certainly done all I asked for, and I hope it will be acceptable to the Government of Scotland. So I think that anybody who's looking at it objectively would conclude that this was a reasonable basis to take forward these specific and unique circumstances. But fundamentally, it has changed, though, hasn't it? The, the nature of the, the settlement has changed. We were in a position where the UK government would not act without agreement. We are now in a position where the UK government may act without agreement. Surely that's a worsening of the situation. The, the, we haven't previously been in a position where, um, as Mr Fraser alluded to, retained uh, EU law was returning to the United Kingdom. So we've sought to find a way to deal with that specific situation. But it doesn't alter the overall devolution settlement uh, as that settlement operates. And it doesn't operate, it doesn't change the basis on which, as, as a, uh, a, th th this Parliament can uh, legislate and indeed uh, further debate and, and, and take and discuss any other uh, issue out with the devolved. It, it doesn't change anything in relation to the existing arrangements for the Scottish Parliament. It merely sets out an arrangement as to what is to happen as these re powers come back from uh, the EU, which are currently operated across the UK and regulated by the EU. And um, if, if I may, yeah. just just to, to, to add to that, um, not only does it not change, but it, it, it actually what you have in front of you expresses our respect for that. Because if you uh, see in the intergovernmental agreement, paragraph four, and I do hope this is something that, that parliamentarians here will, of course, take a good look at when they're considering uh, considering in the weeks ahead. This agreement respects the established constitutional conventions and practices, and consistent with those, the governments the government's plural, reaffirm their commitment to seek to proceed by agreement. And I think that's a positive statement, which I would hope would commend this, this package together uh, to parliamentarians here. But if it doesn't alter or change anything that you've just said, why introduce this new concept of consent decision when we had a perfectly good arrangement in place up until now, which required consent? 
Why we have we, we, we have an existing arrangement in place for the for the devolution uh, settlement as a um, as constructed a, um, in, in 1998. But Jim Wallace, who was one of the architects uh, of uh, that settlement, he made clear yesterday these circumstances weren't envisaged at this time. Uh, you know, and, and it is one of the complexities that we face. Everybody, I think, does acknowledge that. We joined the EU uh, in the 70s. There was no devolution. We took forward the devolution settlements at a point where it wasn't envisaged that we would leave the EU. So, you know, these are hugely complicated uh, uh, areas. We've sought to address this specific situation with a, um, a, the, the arrangements that, that we've brought forward, but they don't alter the existing devolution settlement. And I think the existing devolution settlement and the devolution that has continued to happen is a testament and can give confidence of the commitment to devolution. And I often say, uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a little lightly, but, you know, a government that has devolved income tax and a government that has devolved huge parts of the welfare, serv uh, welfare system is not seeking to power grab crofting. There are not people in London seeking to take uh, control of crofting legislation because under the devolution settlement that rests here, and it should because this parliament is the best place to deal uh, with those issues. Okay, well, thank you, Secretary of State. Thank you, Minister, for attending our evidence taking session this morning. Very grateful to you. I now close this meeting of this committee. Thank you very much.